It pisses you off a bit though, doesn't it? Well, I can it, see it, I can tell. Well, it irritates me because a little bit, and, and I, as I came into politics, you know, people would throw labels around what they thought my faith was. And these were people I hadn't even met, who didn't even know me. What would you march in the street for? There's something I feel very passionate about is modern slavery, for example. It's something that I've been really passionate about for a long time. Um, that's something that I think we could do a better job of and have modern slavery legislation and uh, make sure that we're you know, holding up to ourselves to a standard. There's those things I feel passionate about. I've heard you say that a couple of times. Where, where does that come from? Well, it sort of um, started for me because William Wilberforce was one of my great heroes. You know, he was an abolitionist in, in the UK. Um, and I really admired what he did. Um, I think there's a lot of good that came out of him and his friends around him. Uh, and then I think, um, you know, for us, Amanda and I, we've worked quite hard to make the kids sort of understand the world quite well. And we actually had my daughter go up to the Philippines and actually spend time with kids that have been rescued from trafficking and, and all sorts of things. And so she became a youth ambassador for that through her high school period. And Amanda and I and, and William have all sort of supported her uh, through that. And that's how I got involved with Tear Fund. And they do a lot of work in that trafficking space, uh, in particular in Southeast Asia. Uh, I felt as a business guy, there was a lot that I could do about that with ethical supply chains and making sure I knew where prawns were coming from it in New Zealand or um, at Unilever we spent a lot of time making sure that we had ethical supply chains as well so you know I felt whether I was in a business role or a community role or a political role the three big actors in our society that those sort of issues actually require us to work together and solve those problems. You told the Herald in 2020 that you'd be well positioned to transition from business to politics because quote a lot of it is marketing and my life started off as a brand manager and marketing manager end quote. Do you still think a lot of politics is marketing? No, I don't. I think what I meant by that was just more about, you know, I've done a lot of turnaround jobs with businesses, right? And every business that's lost its way or made a mis you know, is, is needing a turnaround has lost the voice of a consumer. And every political party has actually lost the voice that is doing poorly like the National Party is or has, uh, has actually lost the voice of a voter and actually has got detached from their concerns. In marketing, you've really got to understand consumer needs and you've got to spend a lot of time doing that. Every place I went around the world at Unilever, I had a routine which I'd go from the airport to meet with a consumer in their house before I met with my management teams because I really wanted to understand what was going on in their whole life as much as actually how they were consuming products. And it's the same here with, with voters and, and the public. You know, a lot of MPs actually aren't out and about listening to people all the time. And that's, that's really an important part of you know, um, how you build a great product or a great proposition. You had, what, 18 years with Unilever? Um, and you spent a lot of time climbing the ladder at that company, didn't you? I'm interested, you're, you're a man of faith, you're a man who searches, in your own words, for something bigger than yourself. Why did you pour your heart and soul into a consumer goods company? Yeah, because you know, I was a guy born in Bishopdale, Christchurch. I had young parents, I went to state schools, I was the first to go to university, and I loved business. You know, even as a young, you know, young chap, if you met me at 12 years old, I'd be having window washing rounds and lawn mowing rounds and deck painting, and all, I, had just, I just loved it. And so for me, Unilever was a fantastic place because I got hugely stimulated there. You know, I managed to, I worked only two years in New Zealand and then 16 years overseas. You're working on different businesses that need sorting out. Um, you sell everything from Calvin Klein Cosmetics to Ben and Jerry's ice cream. Uh, you're in developing markets, developed markets. Um, you're thinking about a global re response, a sub-regional response, an individual country response. You work with really uber smart people. And you realise that actually a multinational is, it can actually have a huge difference in the world. Would you be interested in pursuing policies uh, on privatisation or selling down uh, state assets? We had the mixed ownership model at New Zealand, which yeah. I presume you think worked pretty well. Yeah, I did. I thought it worked really well. Yeah. This gave us a good cornerstone shareholding, but also we treated uh, the government as if it was just a normal investor. So would you look at it for, say, Kiwi Bank? Um, no, look, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not really that interested in, you know, um, privatisation of our state assets at this point. You know, I just don't think there's a lot of value in that. I think we've got to the right model. We've got very few corporates in New Zealand, frankly, anyway. Uh, a lot of them are government affiliated or, or branch offices of Australia. Uh, and, you know, I'm very comfortable where we are. So privatisation is not a big 
you know, philosophical driver for me at this point in time. No. Could you rule out state asset sales? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not there to sell off the, our mixed ownership model companies. I think they work very well. But what I would want to make sure is that we are not seeing government interference in the operation of those businesses. And I do worry that they're having undue influence on those organisations. When we interviewed Jim Bolger for the Ninth Floor series mm -hmm. on former Prime Ministers, he said that neoliberal policies had, quote, failed to produce economic growth and what growth there has been has gone to the few at the top. Do you agree with that? No, look, I think our free market system has worked incredibly well around, the free enterprise system has worked incredibly well around the world. It's what actually lifts a lot of people out of poverty. I've seen that up close and personal. But having said that, there is a real role for the state to make interventions when markets fail and markets aren't going to get outcomes. But are you, are you happy with a situation where, at the moment, the 26 richest billionaires own as many assets as the 4 billion people who make up the poorest 50%? of the world population. How can that system be right? Yeah, but, but, but the, the system is, the point for me is, but when you start with that sort of logic, you end up saying you want to equalise outcomes. So I'm always comfortable with the fact that we're going to have, an, you know, an, we're not going to have an equality of outcome at all in New Zealand. But what I really think we need to work much harder on is equality of opportunity. So more people can participate in a free enterprise system that actually helps them. Are you comfortable with, with a world that has gone that way, where 25 people can have as much as half the world? Yeah, well, um, probably not, you know, at some level. And having met some of those people, you know, a lot of them are actually doing a lot of good work. If you think about, you know, the amazing work that, for example, Bill and Melinda Gates have done. You know, Amanda and I have both have seen some of their projects and in the States and, um, yeah, it's been phenomenal what they're doing with their have, wealth. Have you, did you move in those circles? Um, yeah, I, I, I used to go to a Microsoft CEO forum and, and for two or three days. So you know Bill Gates? Yes, I've met him, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, what they're doing around global health or global education, that's pretty inspiring stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, what they've done is it's phenomenal work. Do you want to reduce inequality? Yes, I do. Why give rich people tax cuts, though? But it's not a tax cut, it's actually inflation adjusted tax thresholds, no, but, right? But, but, it's the cleanest but, but, way we can do it now yeah, but, without but, reinventing our whole tax system in the next yeah. few years but to be scrapping, able to do that. Scrapping the top tax rate is inarguably a tax cut for well, wealthy people. Well, one of, well, yeah, but, but it's part of, if you go back through what drives wealth in this country and well, what will drive to higher incomes, it's going to be a combination of things and it's one of several things. So that's a trickle down scenario really, isn't it? No, it's not. I mean, well, if, it, okay, so what, so, is, so the, here's, here's what is the economic rationale for scrapping the top tax rate? So the, is it the What's the economics bit of it? Well, the economic bit is that, A, we didn't support it when the government put no, it no, in no, at short that, that's notice. Politi that's politi yeah, no, 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 that's but I agree, but, but we don't believe it needed to come in. Sure, sure. But what's the economic rationale? We've, we've gone through and you've talked we about Thatcher talent, and Reagan We can attract talent, we can retain talent, we can attract investment here. Uh, it's a component of actually making sure we've got a pro-investment, pro-business sort of environment that actually can work. Would you describe yourself as rich? Uh, well, I, I've, I think I live a very rich life, yeah, and I'm very comfortable, yeah. How do you define rich? Um, essentially being able not to, you know, I, could, I don't have to work, you know, as a sort of essentially, you know, I can, I, I don't really worry too much about, um, you know, whether I've got money or not to be able to afford most things that I would, you know, need. You raised your, your uh, faith in your, in your maiden speech. Mm. Why did you do that? Why did you put that into the public? Yeah, well, it, it was interesting because I think, you know, most of my business career, yes, I've had a faith. I just happened to be a CEO who had a faith, but I wasn't, uh, I didn't have to be the Christian CEO, I just happened to be a CEO, I happened to be a Christian, right? Uh, but when I came to politics, it was quite different in terms of the public discourse about it all. And that's the first time I spoke about it was officially in my maiden speech, and I've tried not to talk about it too much since. You said that it had anchored you and, quote, given my life purpose and shaped my values. Yeah. And another quote here from your own speech, these are your words, my faith has a strong influence on who I am. So it... it it, it is a fair thing to discuss, isn't it? Because it's because we're looking. At, you you may well be the prime minister of New Zealand, making some really big calls. Yep. So, and part of why we're sitting down here, what sort of guy is this guy? What does he believe? What drives his values? And faith drives your values. It's shaped who you are. It's so an important part of who I am. Yeah, absolutely. So how, how might we see those values shape? The way that you well, go. what I was also saying in that speech was that my faith is not a political agenda, right? I am there to represent all New Zealanders, not one faith or, or one religion. And you shouldn't vote for me because of my faith and you shouldn't reject me because of my faith, right? It pisses you off a bit though, doesn't it? Well, I can it, see it, I can tell. Well, it irritates me because a little bit, and, and I, as I came into politics, you know, people would throw labels around what they thought my faith was. And these were people I hadn't even met 
who didn't even know me, you know what I mean? And so they start saying, I think he's this kind of person or well, this kind of Well, they think you're an evangelical this. Christian, yeah, don't and, they? And I don't react to well to those labels because my faith is personal and um, and then it becomes assumptive that these are his views on the world and, and part of it's political. And you don't see it, yourself it as an evangelical Christian, do you? I just you? see myself as a Christian, you know? I don't react to, I, I, I don't see myself labelled in one way or another, you know? And so, um, because essentially it becomes, you know, a shorthand for... A political sort of hit job and a bit of a beat up that you know that that's a little bit of where it sort of went you know but my faith is actually about tolerance compassion not discriminating not rejecting people that's the that's what i think my faith is about we talked about inequality and, and, and poverty and, and welfare to some degree are you going to pursue welfare reform in any respect so i can tell you right now i'm not dreaming up a policy to reform the wealth you know we, we believe in a safety net we believe in the welfare system uh, all kiwis believe that Everybody wants to know that there's a safety net that actually supports them when they're going through tough times. Everyone gets that. So, so it's not about benefit cutting or beating up on beneficiaries, as you've sort of alluded to, you know, with, with your perception of past national governments. That's not been the case. Um, and so the question is, how are we going to really make sure that we're just not writing off a whole bunch of people or consigning them to a life that doesn't realise their potential and enables them to flourish, right? How I'm really serious about that, right? I mean, that's the guts of it, right? Every person is valuable and equal. And I want everybody to generally flourish.